doing this is very unpopular with many breeders, also with many dog breeders that don't take their work seriously because it will naturally result that you might have a litter that is just not good enough for your breeding standard. So what do you do? What I did is normally around one to two percent of each, you know, of the whole uh, percentage of babies goes back into my breeding stock every year. This means I, I, that I really some... want people to hear that. You are listening to Rebecca Hassler of Dragoon Gecko. Rebecca is an EU-based leopard gecko morph breeder, and she is one of the most intelligent and thorough people I have ever had on the podcast. I have a question for you. Is it possible to produce morphs ethically? If your answer is no, then I urge you to listen to this episode. And even if you are somebody who isn't interested in morphs, but is interested in eventually getting into reptile breeding in general, then I would consider this episode a great prerequisite for you because you will gain the knowledge on how to breed properly, how to track the animals in your program, how to select offspring to make sure that you're breeding for character, robustness, and lifespan. I consider the knowledge that you will gain from Rebecca in this episode crucial information for anyone looking to get into reptile breeding. Well, Rebecca, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Hello, Dylan. Thank you so very much for having me today. Well, you're already, as I said to you yesterday, you're one of the most thorough guests I've had on the show. I can tell the way you think. You're you're just a thorough person. I think we will that will be uncovered as we get through this conversation. And and uh, I think this is a really important conversation because it's it's talking about morph breeding from an angle that we haven't before. I think many of the listeners know I often am critical of the morph breeding side because of some of the ethical issues that come along with it. So I don't want to get into that yet. I really want to kind of paint a picture of your reptile story, really where you got to where you are today, because I think that has a lot of foundation to do with, you know, the way you practice herpeticulture now. So why don't you just kind of walk through, you don't have to walk through the whole story, but maybe some of the, those milestone mm -hmm. points in your reptile keeping career. Yeah, sure. So basically, I started off like so many others in the industry as a young teenager. I was instantly smitten with reptiles. I always loved dinosaurs. So I mean, that was a close guess that sooner or later I would stumble upon reptiles and the bug hit me and never left me. So um, basically, for all those uh, who are not familiar with me, I'm from Europe. I'm a European breeder. And yeah, hopefully bringing some different insights and also information on the table here, especially to the international podcast listeners. So I'm a European-based leopard gecko lover, keeper and breeder. I started keeping wild-type leopard geckos in the year 2000. So I have approximately five years of only keeping them and occasionally, you know, incubating an egg. This all started out very soft and very smoothly just as a I love my animals and I love to keep them. And then in 2005, you know, I was smitten with all those um, wonderful new mutations that entered the market, also the or European market for the very first time, the raptors, you know, some trample albino lines, um, the electrics, first electric was imported in 2005. Maybe we'll get to the story later. So I said, I just happened to stumble upon him to the, actually the first founder male that ever set his foot uh, in Europe. And I searched him for over 10 years because I loved him so much. And I think I've never loved and cherished a gecko as much as, as him. I, I cherish all my animals, but this was love at first sight. And it took me over 10 years to chase him down and finally bring him into my collection. So I can be persistent. <laughs> so, so that's an animal and, that you knew, you knew came over and you knew it was somewhere in Europe and you had to figure out what, who bought yeah. it. And the, the, wow, that's amazing. The owner showed it to me. I mean, basically you have, we now have to go. I always love to take people back in history. 2005, it was a completely different time. We have to remember it was suddenly an all time high. The first color mutations arrived on the market from, you know, from the, from the feeling 
from one minute to the other, there were so many options before we had, you know, the wild types, maybe a little bit white and yellow, and that was it. And I was just confident and, and uh, you know, contempt keeping my wild type leopard geckos. And then all of the sudden, with the ham shows getting more and more popular, with more and more people also importing for the first time, that was a huge thing back at that time. It wasn't as easy importing, you know, animals from the US to Europe. So some of the bigger known greater breeders did it for a lot of money those animals i think the first electric was around two thousand dollars and the first raptors they went for two to three k as well per animal and they were i think importing at that time six to ten animals at once so you can imagine how valuable that shipment was. And I just happened to pick up my very first, you know, super hypos with them. And it was just pure coincidence that we started chatting and they were like, you want to see some real cool stuff. And then they opened the box like Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. And I never seen, seen such a beauty before. I was so smitten. I still remember and feel this moment so much. And it was not about that. It was something new. It was just love. It was pure love for this animal, for the way it, it looked. And it had such an intelligent expression that maybe set the first impulse and what we're going on later. So, Maybe I own a lot of what I'm doing today to Saturn and his way of teaching me his way. Mm. So to spoil a little, this was Saturn, the very first electric. I saw him. Of course, he wasn't for sale. And of course, I couldn't afford him. I was just a student with $50 of pocket money mm -hmm. now staring at this gecko. So what do you do? And this changed something in me. So... My focus then became the focus of so many other people that stumble in this industry. You're fascinated. You have few monies and big dreams and big goals. You see all those cool people doing cool stuff and you want to be one of them. You're young, you're hungry, and not only for attention, but also for for you know pushing the boundaries genetically, seeing what's possible. So this passion... I have to admit, was the main driver in my first years. And uh, since 2005, when I bought this first, you know, uh, animals and I had this encounter with Saturn, I really pushed uh, my breeding stock. I bought animals every year. I saved everything I could. I made really well-educated plans. I have to say my veterinary study that I started just at that time really helped me getting a sound understanding of genetics, getting a sound understanding of husbandry, also of, you know, um, behavior. So I always loved my geckos and I always wanted to make sure they're kept under good conditions. But I have to admit, the first years were more focused on how to produce the next cool thing, how to produce to raise the quality in my stock, to raise the prices, to make more money that I can set aside buying better animals mm -hmm. and getting from zero to somewhere. And this took me over 10 years, doing this for 15 years now. And then, you know, approximately around 2012, 2013, I had the second breaking point where I was, you know, working so hard all the years and just focus on this goal, getting a name, getting a good reputation, treating your clients fairly so that they recommend you further, but also experiencing all those negative sides that come along with it. Getting into too many animals too quickly can be really a challenge, you know, some animals thrived others didn't and although you're doing your best and you're taking them to the vet you can always help them you have high costs you have disappointments you have things that you deeply regret although you did everything you could at that time so the more animals you have the greater this risk becomes you're always stressed the more animals you produce the more you are forced to sell the more you're forced to meet the market's expectations especially as a smaller breeder and you're competing with others if you want it or not so others some some see you as friends others see you as competition that's just normal that will always be the case i was always a team player and always very friendly that was maybe a big you know positive thing for me and it led to people being incredibly kind and helpful towards me and my goals but after some years, you're reaching a peak, you're standing there at the top of the mountain, you have done all this work, you have done, you have proven 
that you can do things that you are not able to and hold quality, but also able to improve them further and reach your goals. But then what? So mm -hmm. there was this emptiness and there was also this moments where I was looking at Saturn and all the others and realized, hey, I'm keeping you guys longer than my dog. And I love you. And you're sitting there and you feel comfortable. Yes, maybe, but you're sitting in those boxes and you're not moving so much, you know, as you would in nature. And I was, maybe it was Saturn and his intelligent way of, of interacting with me. He was known as being an um, aggressive biter. He never bit me once in my whole life because we always had a pact. I was really observing him. I was only, you know, handling him under his terms and conditions. And he was the first gecko that really responded to me. Until today, maybe we go into this later, every line, if you're working for a long time with leopard geckos, every line seems to develop certain characteristics. And the electrics, at least the electrics that I work with today from the original stock, in my gene pool that I have, they are incredibly intelligent. They're so awake. They're like the raptors in Jurassic Park. They follow you. They're checking for weaknesses. You know, if you're leaving the door a little mm. bit too much to open, he's there. He will check it out. He'll try to get out. So he doesn't mind. And this was so funny and, and cool to observe. So it it really created the wish in me to to give him a little more than just the standard thing. And it all evolved from here. And simultaneously, other things happened. The big high that was present when I entered the market in 2005 went down. So we have to be aware, and this is what many newcomers do not understand, the leopard gecko market, just like any other market, goes in waves, in cycles. So I wasn't prepared for the cycle to reach the breaking point. I've never experienced that before. And it went down. So the sales went down. You have all these animals to care for. And you're awake at night wondering, should I sell this gecko to this person that I feel not really comfortable with? Or should I keep it and maybe not sell it? What should I do? Can I sell this gecko to the other person that I really, you know, like on a personal side, but where I have to really be afraid that the animal will be genetically, not physically, genetically abused by being crossed into, let's say it's a male, 20 other females of low-end quality, and then the crosses will be all sold as electric. This is what happened. People bought some of my animals and crossed them into almost everything, and everything was now an electric. And we still see this today on Morph Market. The characteristic for an electric is a very distinct unique reddish orange if you have a yellow gecko or a normal tangerine gecko i don't care how many generations of electrics are in there it's not an electric this is not an electric you know so an electric is really to do with the red oranges orange color yes okay. yes and some other distant markers they also have a very very defined spotting it's like an artist, you know, put a pencil in black color and then dropped it over the gecko. They don't have this, you know, more flowing, you know, pattern than maybe some tramper albino lines. They have mm. very distinct spotting. So I can sometimes just from the spotting see how much and high the percentage of an electric cross really is just by looking at the pattern. And they have very... I would say raptor-like facial features. The heads are very small. It is very triangular. And they some of them, like Saturn, had bluish eyes when they are young. It fades a little, but they have a very awake expression. And they are very good observers. So all of that, I think, in summary, makes a good electric. And when you're now faced with a market situation where the market is going down, you're re requesting your husbandry you're seeing that the costs explode, that you have just too many animals that you really, you know, that you can care for, but you're finding it harder and harder to find good places for them. And then, and this was the last straw, you're seeing that all your, all the heroes of the past, all your, you know, 
great breeders that you were a fan fond of when you got into the breeding. When I got into breeding 2005, there were breeders like Marshall McGuinness, Kelly Hammack, Ron Tramper, then the fireman. Nobody knows him anymore. I don't know why. He did amazing things. And so many others. Uh, Jeff Sr., Gail Wood. Amazing. So they were just going out. Some of, you know, financial reasons or personal reasons. Other reached a point of their life where they're getting older and didn't want to, you know, put up with all the pressure and time. And let's be serious, guys, taking care of 50 or 100 geckos is taking a lot of time and effort. It's different than just having one or two geckos as a pet. So I totally understand. But for me, it was getting really lonely at the top, let's say it like that. Yeah, yeah. And I just had a deep depression inside of me, like, where is everybody going? And what came after was, you know, of course, doing things in a different way. Those breeders had created morphs that were very, very popular for a long time. And when they passed out of the hobby, when they went out of the hobby, their names disappeared, the memory of them disappeared, and so did their animals. So what we had at that time, and this is something that almighty no, almost nobody remembers today, and that is so important to me. We had a huge decline in the overall quality of animals worldwide. I'm not saying that they there have always been fantastic breeders. I'm talking of the majority worldwide. We had a drastic decline in overall quality, and we had a drastic wave of extinction. So many lines when the original breeders quit. People didn't see, you know, any reason to continue to work with them because they were all like me at that time in their head, you know, already hunting the next big thing. So right. like, for example, I'm taking dense fire, you know, fire waters. Um, while breeding fire waters and keeping the lime pure, which takes you a lot of time and space and efforts when you can take a fire water paired with an electric and say, oh, it's an electric fire water. Uh, I'm so cool. I did this F1 cross. But guess what, darling? This is nothing. That's just a cross. That's just coincidence. I could. It's like in a game of cards when you throw your first card. That That's not a move. That's yes. not a tactic. You know, and for me, breeding leopard geckos was never a game of rugby it was a game of chess and i realized suddenly oh if you don't do something now if you don't overthink your way of of going forward you will see all those things disappear forever mm -hmm. and that was so heartbreaking to me that i did something very drastic i cut down a, my collection to a really smaller amount of animals i focused on the few projects that were really important to me. And I basically turned from a young breeder, aka teenager who hunted the next big thing to somebody who is more in the position of a holy grail keeper, you know, a kind of Jurassic Park zookeeper who is taking in those really old and extinct bloodlines and trying to preserve them for future generations to enjoy. So I think this was a a really dramatic change in my personal career. And it brought so much joy and so much unexpected development. Once I really, you know, started that way, I also questioned whether I could improve my housing conditions. Although I have to say, guys, I have been in US several times. I love you. I love your systems. And the U.S. system is or also the legal situation is a little bit different from what is over here in Europe. So because I'm based in Europe, of course, I have to, you know, adjust to the um, European authorities. So, for example, one big difference that I get or a question that I get asked very often, what's the difference being a reptile keeper in U.S. versus a reptile keeper in um, EU is basically that you're not allowed by law in many European countries to keep your animals permanently in wrecks. This includes Germany, where I live in. You are mm -hmm. only allowed to keep your adults in terrariums or terrarium-like buildings. And then you're allowed to keep the babies in wrecks. And also, you know, animals who are coming in into quarantine or in, in medical treatment, but you can't keep them their whole life in wrecks. 
And what I observed also was as soon as I, mm, my first terrariums were very practical oriented, you know, I, I was really taking inspiration from the American style of doing things and the rack system. So, of course, there were terrariums and they had the space, but there wasn't really much, so much going on mm -hmm. except for the basics. And that is what I requested more and more and more during the years. And um, I came up with more and more ideas to to make it, you know, my work um, safe and secure from the animals from a hygienic standpoint, but also offering them, you know, different um, climbing walls or different objects that we change and, and you know, just enrichment possibilities that can be exchanged. And what I realized is that especially when when you import geckos that are you know just used to living in the wrecks they take some time to adjust but they completely change their behavior mm -hmm. and i think we had this talk already in another you know episode on your podcast are leopard geckos boring well if they're sitting all the day in the wrecks they don't do very much but if you're you know giving them a chance and coming and you know um, think about how you come closer to their natural environment and giving them some more stimuli, you will realize how fascinating and intelligent they are and how active they become. Mm -hmm. Their total, you know, behavior changes. They are also displaying social behavior that is so interesting and friendly that you would probably not see in a sterile environment where they, you know, are fighting each other or where the matriarch female gets all the food and the others doesn't. So I think there is a lot of hidden treasures lying there. And this was something that still made me very happy. And I'm also, you know, um, very thankful that my partner also always encouraged this way of thinking when he came into my life and was like, oh, can't we do a little bit more for them? And what about if I build this? And what about if we do that? So I also is, had is a great encouragement. Is he a reptile person? Or, no. no, okay. Yeah, Not I, at I do, all. I do find people that come from the outside of, of herpeticulture will look at the basic setups and go, they, they feel more empathetic towards the animals than we do yeah. in some sense because they, they, they can see how unnatural it is. And in a lot of ways, we become desensitized to it because we see it all the time. So you take somebody exactly. who doesn't know what they're looking at, they go, can't we give them a little more space or like put a plant in there? And sometimes that feedback's really helpful. Exactly. And this is why it's always so valuable for every breeder, myself and any other person on the planet to get some input and actively search for input from outside. Because what we can become is what the dog and horse breeders are calling kennel blind. If you're becoming kennel blind, you're just seeing your sphere and your needs and you're basically cutting yourself out from the option to learn and to evolve, evolve. And that this is something that is so important to me that has always been a big part of my work, always keeping an open mind, always questioning, can I do something better? Um, how is the animal experiencing this? What's better for the animal versus, of course, taking into consideration what's good for the whole colony? Because it is indeed a really big difference if you're just housing one pet gecko in a 100% naturalistic vivarium, whatever, uh, terrarium, or if you, you know, are housing and be responsible for a bigger colony. So, of course, you have to make some adjustments, but I think there are so much possibilities here. And, you know, due to the European situation, um, the legal situation, I was also encouraged going this road and I can highly recommend it because it's it also opened the door for so many interesting observations and encounters I now really enjoy so much more going through my stock even if I'm free you mm -hmm. know yeah, yeah. in the past when you're just housing them in the tubs you're happy when you're done and then you come back when they need food or water but if you have a surrounding where they really want to interact also with you it's a different story they know when I com I'm coming and they're standing at the front and sometimes they're escorting me and that's just amazing to see. Oh, I mean, you've said so many amazing things in these last 12 minutes or 15 minutes that I want to oh, dig sorry. into. And, and no, 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 that's really good. Like, I, I think that that should resonate with a lot of people. And, and one one quick thing just regarding the kennel blindness, I think that is such a a 
pervasive issue within reptile breeders is and for those who don't understand kennel blindness it's a lot of times you'll overlook issues with your own animals because you're trying to push towards some sort of goal where you're you know maybe yeah you see a, a, a wobble in your spider but instead of thinking maybe i shouldn't breed that animal you do it anyway because you know the price tag on the clutch whatever and that is a massive problem and we're going to talk about kind of how you can eradicate some of that in a little bit because you you have this like very specific system but i wanted to dwell on one point for a second and that's that those early years where you kind of rose up and started riding the wave of the excitement of morphs and, and chasing that new morph or producing a new thing. I think that in itself is the issue that we have right now in herpeticulture. That, that, that feeling that people have when they, when they want to just explode onto the scene and create something new. And like you said, you end up in a spot where you're kind of lonely and the animals become a chore I don't even know if I have a question, but just that's what I see. I see young breeders getting into it for that reason. And then a lot of times they get tricked because they're buying quote unquote investment animals. And by the time they get to the point where they can sell the the litter or the clutch, uh, the animals aren't worth as much as they were. So you, be, you become the person with, you know, it's like the hot potato. And, uh, that, that that's one of uh, that's just an issue that I see and it's, I think it's such a hard thing to solve because it is so exciting as a young breeder right to get into it you want to be involved in the community you want to be the person that produces something new but I think the story that you just told there just shows how how it's almost it's it's a it's a facade in a way there it, it's almost like gambling you're not going to get to the end of that and it's less exciting than you probably think at the beginning I don't know if that makes sense I agree and disagree what I wanted to to let people know is that I totally understand the passion that comes with, you know, wanting to be a breeder that is known and respected because I think that that has been, you know, people wanting to go into the hobby to chase the next big thing, they have always been there. They have been there in the year 2000 and 2005 and they will be there in 20 years. So that is not the issue. Um, the problem has always been there and it's not a problem as long as it's, you know, as you're carefully thinking about um, where you are, how do you get where you want to be and how to do it in a responsible way. So um, I wanted to say, I totally understand everybody. I have done it and I have proven that you can do it. I mean, I started basically what I did back in 2005. Um, many more were not really, you know, approachable for me from a financial status at that point. So mm -hmm. I had to think about what can I afford? Um, how do I get the best quality of what I can afford? And how do I ensure that this is something that I can develop? For example, it makes absolutely no sense if you want to build up a breeding stock buying two super snows because all they will produce are super snows. So you will not, you're reaching a dead end genetically. If you're buying a tangerine, for example, or a hypoxantic or whatever, just anything that is polygenetic, you can by selective breeding improve the looks and the quality over time. But, and here's the catch, you have to know what you're doing. You have to willing to invest not only in the animals, but also in knowledge to yourself. And that has always been the main issue. And that has always been the main factor where you can put your finger on. This is the factor that decides whether you become a successful breeder or not. Are you willing to do your homework? Are you willing to either, you can either go the traditional way that I did back then because it wasn't so available. You can buy the books. You can, you know, read reliable sources because remember, guys, still today, books are the best source of, you know, mistake-free information because a book, before it gets published, it gets, you know, through a lecture and it gets, you know, tested and and controlled and you have to verify what you're saying if you're saying leopard geckos are not aggressive you have to verify and you know link a study and uh, or search out a study and then it is put at you know the annex at uh, the end of the book so in the internet i can basically say anything i can say yeah sure you can get one of my violet geckos and you pair it with any other gecko and you get all violet geckos great but that's not the truth so um, you have to be very careful today. Information is easily available, but there are also many ways where you can't really ensure the information is accurate. And the accurate information is the key of going somewhere. And you're working with living creatures. 
And doing a mistake can cost them their health, their vitality, their life quality, sometimes even their life. So we have to put this into just in, in the back of our minds and being a little bit respectful and thankful that those animals, you know, in my case, the early animals, they brought me where I am today. So I'm very thankful for all the hard work. They have done the work. I just see myself as the one pulling a little string here and there. Mm -hmm. But I think that is the important part. And um, I also think it is it is very important to figure out at the beginning what you want to do. You brought up a fantastic point, Dylan. Um, in today's market, it's so easy, you know, just buying what seems to be hot and then crossing it to anything that you see and find it cool. And by the time you can sell those crosses who look like not one of them either, most of them, they look like a wild mixture, there suddenly is no market for them two years later because the market isn't as hot anymore. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand a little bit of marketing and how the market works and you have to take that into consideration. So in years that do not go well, I don't breathe that much. And I think this is also something, of course, I don't like it. I love many babies, but do I really need them? No, not really. So, and I think this is also a very important aspect that um, I also wanted to to bring home. Um, when I changed my way of thinking and the I also changed the whole way Dragoon Gecko was run in the first years, I was buying, you know, the best animals that I could afford and I did selective line breeding. So... I was really doing my homework and slowly and steadily working my way up. The animals became gradually better and better and better. And in some cases, um, the results were obvious and people were like, oh, yeah, those are nice geckos. You're doing good work. And in other cases, you saw nothing like in the lavenders that maybe we will, you know, give as a perfect example later when I started with them, they just had a little speck of violet here and there. They were just ordinary geckos with a little bit of more lavender. So they looked nothing like what I produce today. And my goal has always been, one of my personal holy grails has always been an all purple gecko. And keep in mind, leopard geckos are yellow with dark spots. So mm -hmm. this is a very hard goal and it's highly polygenetic. And even at that time, lavender was seen as the most difficult color to breed. So naturally, everybody told me, Rebecca, it's not possible. You're wasting your time. They are nice, but don't waste your time on them. Get into other stuff. And I just followed this feeling that I had deep in my, sorry, deep in my soul that, um, yeah, just told me to, to continue. And I just selectively bred them. And I also didn't push it to the maximum. I really, like in all my projects, I do not breed a project with just one breeding group. I'm having several uh, genetically unrelated groups that I can do a highly educated and complex system of well thought out line breeding. And line breeding is not crossing brothers and sisters and siblings back to the mother or the father guys. Line breeding, like it's done in racing horses or in high end dog breeders kennel, is a very complex, very thought out system that tracks all the positive and negative markers that evaluates which animals even have the base quality to be considered going into breeding. And they keep the inbreeding coefficient as low as possible at all times. And you definitely need to keep track and you need to um, establish and work out a stud book. And all this knowledge wasn't there. This is all what I did many nights I was sitting there and thinking about how I can bring all those data into a system that allows me to create pedigrees for my leopard geckos like you would see in a dog in a purebred dog how can I go five to ten generations back I can do that today and see exactly which founding fathers paid which percentage of influence mm -hmm. so whenever I pick two geckos and I put them together in theory on paper I can tell you exactly how much percentage I'm closing down of maybe the one founding father like Saturn and how much is too much and how much is okay. And when I need to do outcrossing and when I need to do, you know, 
going a little further away genetically. So it's always a game of, you know, going closer, going wider, going closer, going wider. It's, it's, it's a very complicated net, but it's worth it. And you're ending up with a stable population that grows slowly, but steadily. And you don't have this, you know, line after three or five generations that has a short snout, that has bug eyes, that has spinal issues, that has, I don't know, infer you know, infertility issues, that maybe has neurological issues and God what who, you know, God knows what. So it takes time. And in case of my lavender, it took me 15 years. Mm -hmm. But it brought me to a point where I have a stable colony of really high lavender geckos. And what everybody seemed impossible, including myself, it was just chasing the dream, became reality. And I'm so thankful for that. But it is definitely something that you have to take into account and that you have to be willing to invest into. You don't only invest money. You're investing a lot of time mm -hmm. and dedication from your side. I just want to take a short break from today's episode to thank each and every one of you for tuning in today. If you would like to show more support for the podcast, you can do that by checking out the show's sponsor, Custom Reptile Habitats. There is an affiliate link in both the YouTube description and the show notes. If you do make a purchase through that link, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. The other way you can show support to the podcast is through the Patreon account. For as little as 75 cents per episode, you will automatically be added to the Discord server so you can communicate and chat with other like-minded keepers. If you do bump yourself up to the $5 a month tier, you'll have early access to the episodes and the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests. Again, I am so grateful for each and every one of you. This podcast is a lot of work and costs me a lot of money each month to run, and any support coming from your end is greatly appreciated. Back to the episode. Well, and I think to summarize that, it was just, I think that was so perfectly said is the, that want to produce something new and to work on an exciting project. I think you're totally right. That's not going anywhere. And I think you've completely clarified my position by how you said that is it's the lack of knowledge that often gets people stuck in traps. I, I see it all the time on Facebook groups. What happens when I breed this morph with this morph? And it's people just barely grasping the surface of genetics that are already getting into breeding and they don't even know how the genetics work together or anything. But they're, like you said, they're just taking two crosses, which is not impressive. It's like taking a a greyhound that's designed to run that's, you know, 40 generations back and a husky that's designed to do the Iditarod you know, pull, sled pulling and then Perfectly putting them together said. and saying that you've done like a greyhound husky. Yeah. It's like you haven't done anything. You just took all the work from all the men and women who have bred those dogs and done a cross and now you have a greyhound with long hair or something and it's not overly impressive. So I think that that, that, that was so well said. I, I want to get into the system that you use to keep the organization and I, I, I'm sure people are just chomping at the bit to figure out, you know, how do we line breed? How do you, how do you outcross to make sure things stay together? Um, before we do that, can you let everybody know? So you, you've mentioned a few of them, some of the, the actual lines that you're working with, some of the morphs that you do focus on, mm -hmm. and then maybe we'll jump into the, the system. Sure. Yes. Uh, so in my early years, I became mostly known for my work with the ghost trade, and because ghost was at that time a very already an older mutation and it was very plain and nobody had great interest in it because it was just a base dominant mutation and it had a little hint of green. The animals were very muddy, not really colorful. And due to the lack of, you know, alternatives, um, I just fell in love with them. I found them very interesting. And I couldn't afford, you know, those high-end electrics at that time. So what I did, besides some other projects, of course, I was taking those original ghosts and I cleaned them up. I brightened the colors. I crossed them into well-thought-out other projects that I knew, you know, I was tr really trying to figure out at first, what is this ghost gene doing? So does it develop color? Does it take color away? What does it do? I, I looked at some of the crosses that were done and then I figured out a plan. And of course, then um, at that point, you have a theory, but you haven't had your own experiences with a morph. And I think this is also the the very important stage, stage one. You're planning all of this on paper. You're very considerate what do I want to work with? What is this gene doing? What would make sense? Would it really make sense crossing this to that? Does it really improve something? Or is it just because I think it would be cool? So, 
this is the first thing. So that's what I did. And then I took my experience from the first crosses and pushed the ghost further and further. And so after some time, I really, uh, you know, made some good progress and became known for the first jungles, jungle stripes, Max No Ghost jungles. And um Especially then later, I crossed them into the Albay's ghost. I completely crossed out the Maxno gene because I found that the quality of many Maxnos is not as brilliant and stable as the Limebred Snow genes. And plus, I didn't want to end up with all those, you know, super snows that I really can't work with. They are not really something that I wanted to follow because the super snow looks like a super snow. And I found that the super snow was blocking the ghost gene. So there was no way for me to 100% ensure my clients, this is a super snow ghost. And this is also something that I found myself, um, you know, that I felt responsible for. If people are investing their money in my geckos, no matter if they're buying high or low end, they deserve an honest explanation. And if I'm producing in masses, what I really can confirm, that's not a good way to build up a business. So I was always thinking about, you know, how can I ensure um, that the animals are truly ghosts, which combinations, you know, have a good person, you know, a good, good, good potential of really showing, expressing the ghost gene to the fullest. And that's what my work, you know, um, that's how I became known <laughs> in this scene. I'm sorry, I'm not a native speaker, guys. Sometimes I stumble. So, um, yeah, especially the Albay's ghost then changed a lot. So I became, Dragoon Gecko became known over the years as the cradle of Albay's ghost. We've done a lot of crosses with them. We, you know, did... Um, I had the huge pleasure and privilege due to the fact that Ghost wasn't much worked with to, you know, do many first world combos with them. Also, sometimes just by accident, um, the first Montanus Ghost Raptors, which had an unusual eye pigmentation and were so much more fertile and, and you know, bigger and stronger than the normal Ghost Raptors just by crossing the wild blood into them. This was also a fantastic step into the right direction. Um, not so much focusing on looks alone, but also, you know, taking into consideration what would be good for this line. And when I saw my ghost raptors, I saw that they would really need a push of, of more body strength. You know, this was something that I really wanted to bring in. So the Montanos and the wild form was, was a perfect opportunity for me to do that. And also later on, I took over um, the first electrics from Kelly and also became known for my work with the electrics since 2007 with my first male volcano that was imported directly from Kelly and has been the most famous founder male in Europe beside Saturn for the electrics ever since. So I'm really glad that I still have his far, far descendants from today. And he was definitely also one of my males that has, you know, like in a horse breeding stable, he has changed everything because he was what we would call in the horse breeding a universal breeder. He would own, always improve. No matter what females you put on him, he would always improve the quality, not also in color, but also in body strength and in character. He had a very, very nice personality, very docile, very tame, very easy to handle. So this was also something that I had to take into consideration further down the road. If I want to work not with wild types that are never you know, supposed to being put back in the wild, I have to think about how can I also genetically select my animals for character that is suited for life in captivity. Mm. And the less stress an animal feels when it's interacting with you, the better his overall quality of life becomes. So, of course, the first geckos who were more easily stressed and aggressive, I put out of my breeding program and I was really focusing on narrowing it down and, um, you know, concentrating on animals from unrelated gene pools that had this docile personality and that also manifested and strengthened within all my lines. So also something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really amazing. And, um, just as you're talking, I was thinking, you know, because there are people who are very against morphs where they might keep just wild type animals, but you can still run into really bad genetic issues if you're not doing things thoroughly like you're doing, like, because yeah. you might end up just breeding brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers to, or, you know, together, and you're still dealing with the genetic bottlenecking issue. So in some ways, striving to stay away from morph production can also cause genetic 
you know, degrade, like degrading the genes of the animals that you're working with. So let's talk about the system. As you said, you, you, you kind of compared it to um, a horse stable, like a racehorse stable or a, a high quality dog kennel. And just by the way you're speaking, it really sounds like that. So can you tell us how does this, how does this work? What, what, when you step into your room and you're going to decide to pair animals, yeah. how, what do you do? So uh, first of all, I had to design a system that worked for me. So what I have, I have my own system of stud books where every breeding animal, every founder animal of, of all the years before, you know, is written down and documented uh, sometimes whenever possible also with pictures so that I have a really clear understanding of what this animal's individual strength and weaknesses are. And this is something that you can only find out by comparing the your animal to a standard. In pure breeding dogs or horses, you're taking a horse and you have the ideal, the ideal, the standard. This ideal is often impossible to reach, but that's not the point. The point is to come as close to this um, quality as possible. And depending on how you set your standard will determine if your work is working or if you're running into trouble if you're now saying like oh the standard is red i'm only breeding for red color then you oversee the anatomy then you oversee all the issues that can come but if you're like me you know sitting down carefully and writing a standard i had to write my own standard <laughs> because there was no standard for leopard geckos so martina and i sat down and said okay well let's think about this for a moment how would mother nature how would mother nature select you know, what does a leopard gecko need to have? He needs to have a, a straight spine. He needs to have a whole tail. He needs to have good angulations in the hind legs, muscleation that muscles that allow him to be, you know, quick and, you know, allowing him to climb, doing all those things. The eyes should be well set into the skull. The upper jaw and under jaw should be in a line and so on and so forth. And then at the very last step, when we were finished with all the anatomy aspects, we're coming to the color. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I always compare my leopard gecko breeders and youngsters first to the standard and how well they fit in there. Also, are there small and not really eating or are they really you know healthy and going after the food and active this is something that i really want in my breeding program and this is what i focus on so you see your breeding catalog your standard consists of many 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 points anatomy behavior feeding response uh, character and then at the very last step uh, the individual markers that make this certain mutation. For example, in electric, I want a reddish leopard gecko. If I have to choose between two equal leopard geckos and one is yellow and the other is red, I'll take the red one. And now comes the trick. If I end up, you know, doing this is very unpopular with many breeders, also with many dog breeders that don't take their work seriously because it will naturally result that you might have a litter that is just not good enough. Mm -hmm. for your breeding standard. So what do you do? And what I did is normally just around one to 2% of each, you know, of the whole uh, percentage of babies goes back into my breeding stock every year. This means I, I, that I really some... want people to hear that because <laughs> that's really mind blowing. And it, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense. If you're serious about something, you're not going to have a secretariat and every, you know, every time a horse yeah. comes up, it's just, that's not how it works. So it's going to be a yeah. very small percentage yeah. of animals that hit the standard. So one to 2% of the animals that you produce go back into the program. Not yes. all of them. Never. And to put it very clearly, and this was advice that changed a lot for me coming from a very, you know, a successful horse breeder. He was telling me, Rebecca, if you want to go somewhere into breeding, you have to be patient and wait for the next generation. You can't just take, you know, the first filly, uh, you know, offspring of, of, of your mare because you love her. I'm waiting years because I want to have that one foal that is at least able to express the quality of the mother or ideally it should top her. And mm -hmm. then I will take her into breeding. So that's what I do. In every generation, I only accept animals that at the very least can provide me the same quality in all those aspects that we talked about. Not just coloration, not just anatomy, all of those aspects. 
And the best case, they should top it. And then it's a breeding animal for me. And then I ensure that, you know, I have a very stable line that is blossoming and I don't have inbreeding problems because I, on the same time, I'm working with three to four different gene pools that I can use and crisscross with each other. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that it's that robustness that's part of the the standard that is really important to hit because if you like you said if you just focus on the phenotype of the skin the scales it, it, you you end up with all sorts of things and that's what happens in the dog world when people breed to a standard but maybe they're not breeding like I've said this on the podcast before maybe they're breeding their black labs to look like the black lab but they're not breeding the dogs that are good at retrieving ducks so you have yeah. a dog that looks like a black lab but he doesn't retrieve ducks and then you continue to breed it and eventually you get to a dog that can't do anything because you've lost the physical traits and part of it's like, well, I don't want to use, I don't want my dog to retrieve ducks. Well, you want a dog that's capable of running and sprinting and swimming and having a healthy, robust uh, immune system. And yeah. whether or not you're going to use it for hunting is, is, is it doesn't really matter. It's more about the health of the animal. And so uh, I'm sure people are wondering when you have a, a litter uh, of animals that you're not going to use, wh what, what do you do with them? Mm -hmm. So also what I wanted to add in here um, exactly and what the system does is that it saves you so much time. Um, what seems as a long way and hard way of doing things is actually saving you so much money, time and trouble because every generation will only consist of animals that really, you know, have like in nature, the cap, you know, the, the possibilities to produce healthy offspring so at the very least you will end up with stable sound offspring that you can sell with good conscience to other people this will help your reputation especially as a newcomer immensely and you will learn and know what you're doing you will realize true quality when you see it and you'll end up in two or three generations of doing this you will end up at the same spot where someone who's just crossing things and he's breeding 20 generations mm -hmm. and not going anywhere. So I see this so often that there are people there, some with real talent, uh, new to the scene, and they just are not aware of this. So whenever we are talking about breeding systems, of course, we could talk about this here a lot. It's not so easy as it looks. I mean, you already got a quick glance into, but this is also you know, why I'm doing my coaching programs. This is exactly why I take my clients and walk them through individually their animals and help them search fitting breeding partners and help them upsetting breeder systems that ensures that they are reaching their goals in the shortest amount of time genetically, mm -hmm. but not time-wise. Yes. So they're getting there quicker, but have to, they have to wait a little. And what I always say to my clients is, as a breeder, you can afford to be picky. And you should be because you own it to your animals. And once you, you put really... a poor quality animal into a line, you cannot get it out. Exactly. So what, what do we do with all those animals that are not good enough, you know, for your personal breeding standard? So let's be real here. What is not good enough for my personal breeding standard might fit perfectly for somebody else who is just at the beginning or has a different goal. If your goal is to breed yellow geckos, and now I have, let's say, in this pool of electric tangerines, that one gecko that is bright yellow, that would be the perfect catch for you. I would be happy to, to sell it off and you would be happy to have a sound bloodline that you can use for this project and give it another spin. So doing wanting to do things differently is not so much the problem per se. It is just that I see many, you know, newcomers just focusing on that. And when I can give what I can give as an advice coming from my own experience and what has worked for me, yes, I have done new things and tried that, but my greatest success and the most I have learned, especially in the first years, was just basically getting into a project and just trying to recreate it and, and hold it for two or three generations because that's the hardest part, guys. It's never the issue. You know, if you're hatching 100 babies, you will hatch one that is more beautiful than the others. I guarantee you that. No matter what animals you take, that's just how nature works. You will always get one that is slightly more beautiful than the others. But that's not what defines a good breeder. A good breeder is defined and Again, we can learn a lot from horse and from dog breeding that over a longer period of time, over the generations, you are able to raise the quality 
that is entrusted to you to a higher level or at the very least, if you get them in high quality, you and hold them. And sometimes this can be the really tricky stuff because as seen in electrics, they are highly polygenic. I can never guarantee, you know, what will hatch, although I'm doing my best and all the results getting better and better and more and more like Kelly has imagined them, the original breeder. I still can't, you know, sell you any hatchling and say, oh, we'll turn out red. No, that's not how it works. So we, we have to grow them. We have to see and then we have to evaluate which female would give the best results with which male. Because with male number one, it might not work out. But with male number three, you might just have the perfect match. So this is all, all goes into those breeding systems. And it's a really, you know, complex but well thought out process that is so well worth diving into and establishing for you guys that, you know, want to dive into this topic, you can either, you know, um, get into horse breeding and dog breeding books and trying to select the information for yourself. Of course, many things are different and do not really work because in many leopard geckos, you don't just have the data. You can be lucky if you know the parents and getting breeders that can tell you parents, great pet brand parents and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy, but there are some other breeders beside me who are doing this. So I'm very lucky that uh, there is, you know, uh, great work done and a breeder with amazing talent who will gladly tell you the, you know, past the genetic and the potential of the projects they're working with. So trying to absorb to get as many information as possible and also invest in yourself, not only investing in a top gecko. Sometimes, you know, if people ask me, how do I get success quicker? By investing $1,000 in one or two geckos or investing $1,000 in education, I would always choose education because mm -hmm. this knowledge stays forever. And Absolutely. you have it from now until forever. It's a game changer. I've done it. I've taken, you know, um, mentorships with people who are breeding other species, um, paid a lot of dollars. It was so worth it. It, it, widen my horizon and I can just really, you know, um, pass this experience to others that it is always worth investing in yourself. And of course, if you don't have that much money, then you have to go the old and painful way by digging through all the books you can find and taking everything you read in the internet with a grain of salt and going back to scientific studies. You know and then you basically need to know how to read them because every study has its pro and cons. You know, if you have to also question scientific papers, for example, if there has been a study done that proves, let's say, that leopard geckos are friendly and you see that there's just five animals that have been tested, then, well, is it really you know, that accurate or might be another study where 500 leopard geckos have been tested a little bit more accurate. So you always have to, you really dig deep, in, deep into the scientific stuff. And that's just something that is very difficult for some people to handle. And this is also why, of course, I decided to, you know, um, put this all into a genetic coaching program to help newcomers out getting their um in a shorter amount of time, but at the same time, really doing it the responsible way and getting the knowledge they desperately need in order to um, provide the animals the best care and being responsible with what they produce. Right. Yeah. And I, I want to, I'm going to ask you some questions about that as well. Um, <laughs> but before I do, I have two questions. One is the leopard gecko standard published anywhere for people to read. And then the second one is what do you use as signs for inbreeding or, or poor poor health or like are the things that stand out right away where you go okay I'm getting to actually maybe we'll save that question because I think that'll kind of I want to get back mm -hmm. into the, like the line breeding and the cross breeding so maybe mm -hmm. you can ask the answer the um the the standard question first and then and then I'm gonna ask some questions about can the you process. repeat that question please for me <laughs> is is the leopard gecko standard that you created is that published somewhere for people to read no, it's not. It's something that I give to my coaching clients okay. um, because I also, you know, everybody has maybe its own opinion, what is important and what not. And also I have to say, sorry, some things are really my, you know, knowledge and my 
system that I've built up over so many years mm -hmm. that ensures me to, you know, work the way I do. And as much as I would love to share it with everybody, there will always be some people who disagree and I just don't like drama. So I'm not really, you know, thinking about publishing it. Maybe I will in the future, we will see. But um, I think that also it is your... <laughs> responsibility as a breeder to also do some brain work yourself and mm -hmm. think about uh what nature would do i mean i can always help in my coaching program my my coaching clients basically get this standard but it basically covers what we have you know already talked about um just go into this topic make the deep dive and um be willing to spend some time thinking about what you're doing and what you want to do. If you're not willing to do this as a breeder, this will lead you to a very dangerous path. And I think this is also one of the characteristics I want to see in aspiring breeders, at least the ones who will make it and who have the potential to become respected, famous breeders. They are never too proud or too lazy to do the work. They will yeah, always I, be willing to to you know reflect a little bit, and there are some things that you can teach others, and there then there are other things that you really have to learn and think about. And of course, when I put out a standard, I would be afraid to be honest to give the impression that this is the only way of breeding and that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. And that's not what I want to do here. I don't want to put fingers on anybody. There's always more than one way doing things right. Intelligent people know that and successful people always live by that. So this is just my personal way. But what I can give you as a tip is really think about Put yourself in the leopard gecko's shoes. You know, what do you need to survive in the wild physically? Mm -hmm. And what would you need to thrive in a human's environment mentally? And then at the very least, you're thinking about, you, you're looking, if, for example, if you're uh, interested in electrics, that's also the way that I approach things. I'm looking at pictures. I'm looking and I'm looking at first pictures I look at are the original pictures from Kelly Hammack. Because she founded the electrics in the early 2000s. So I want to see what she saw in this line. And I just don't go on Morph Market and buy the one thing that I can buy and that I like. I want to know what an electric really looks like. Because that's like going to your local car shop and like, I want a Ferrari. Uh, and then you buy going out with a Fiat. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what makes a Ferrari, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that hard. And even if, you know, sometimes the label is covered, you would still be able to guess that it's maybe a Ferrari and not a Maserati, right? Because yeah. of subtle little details. And this is what you have to do as a breeder. You have to train your eye. And the only thing to do that is, for example, let's stay with the electrics. You want to go into electrics? Fine. First thing is you do some research. Who has, you know, invented them? Who has worked with them? and invented them. How do those animals look? How do they look today? And then you look in the internet and then you're selecting your animals based on someone that you trust and who maybe works longer with them, but also who has the animals that resembles that animals from the past. And that's also why we come again into the important topic and holding quality is sometimes even harder than creating something new. Mm -hmm. The electrics have given me nightmares. They're <laughs> really really difficult to breed in a high quality especially with a big gene pool it is possible but what seems so flawless and easy in my case sometimes takes me one step forward two steps back one step forward three steps back and it's not always you know the situation that you envisioned like you're having those 10 eggs and you're hatching all those red babies and then you know you're totally in love with them you have to constantly work you know, your way through the quality and ensure that it's going in the right direction and not going away from the original way the electrics were intended. Funny um, side note, I just released some reels about the electrics recently and I also used Kelly's original founder female. The original founder female, Electra, looks totally different from all the electrics that she produced in the years afterwards. And also she looks completely different how an electric 
should look like, in her opinion. But people love her. So everybody was, you know, when I compared the pictures, like, oh, this was the first electric from Kelly. And then, you know, in the real came a cut and then my animal. And this is an animal today. People were PMing me like, oh, do you also breeding that other gecko? I want that other gecko. The electrics at that time were so cool. No, it was just one animal. So mm -hmm. again, yes, that animal was cool, but it seems that this look wasn't, you know, something that was able to pass through the next generations and they still look stunning. So we have to really do the research and find out, is this animal that I'm looking for really a good representative of its trait in mm -hmm. all aspects, of course? And then we can evaluate, do I want this animal or is it worth, you know, investing in or not? Yeah. Well, and I think it's probably such a good mental exercise for someone who's getting into a breeding project to go through, to, to create a standard of their own. Of course, it doesn't have to be just leopard geckos, whatever you're working with, ball pythons or boas or whatever it is, create a standard that you can use. Because I think partly that would give you a little bit of more mental strength to call, I don't mean kill, but call the poor quality animals out of your breeding program because you have this idealistic thing that you created yourself. So you have, it's like an art project, like you have this standard yeah. that you're working towards and you could easily say, okay, these babies, yeah, they're going to be great pets for someone down the road, but they're not part of the program. If you don't, if you didn't spend the time and the energy to put together this, you know, idealistic standard, then you're probably willing to just be kennel blind again and, and you know throw things into the, into your breeding project without having any concern about you know moving away from your ideal i mean your audience can basically let me know what you think about would it be a good idea to publish the standard or would other you know breeders probably get offended or feeling under pressure i don't really want to do that because again this is just my personal way of thinking mm -hmm. and my personal way of ensuring quality but if you if this is something that you would enjoy i can think about doing that in the future however i want to stress out that as you said it's such a good mental exercise also to question the standard and not bashing the one who's invented it but rather you know thinking about is my situation 100% fitting for the standard or is there maybe the one or other point that maybe I haven't thought about that you want to add in your program that is important to you and then it becomes you know your own reflection on things and then you've learned so much by just you know dealing with the topic instead of just passively consuming all those content and thinking that you can get a top leopard gecko breeder by watching five YouTube videos. And mm -hmm. th that's unfortunately not the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, okay, let's go through some of this process. Can you can you sort of define the line breeding process and, and the outcrossing and, and how, how this works? And, and uh, yeah, maybe just we'll start with that. Okay, so let me take you to the process from start and finish. Whenever I'm, as I said, I have few projects. I'm currently working with lime bread snows and ghost combos. I'm working with electrics. I'm working with some old trample lines. I'm working with high-end lavender lines that I invented that they go back until 2005. This is, uh, as we talked about, one of my oldest projects and uh, they just evolved you know, recently into the ultra ultraviolet line, which is basically just, just a line bread lavender gecko that has a very high percentage of being all lavender with some all lavender geckos hatching. And then we have, you know, uh, the lilacs, which are a more a spontaneous, a sp a spontaneous occurrence in my stock. And we still need to figure out what they are because they have a different coloration while the normal ultraviolets are more the typical lavender color, more bluish violet. The, uh, the lilacs have more a magenta-like coloration, which is very interesting and very unique. So um, those are basically the things I'm working with. Of course, I always have the one or other secret project I'm working with. That's my job, hey, <laughs> to keep things interesting. <laughs> and that, of course, I'm also a very careful person. I hate to, you know, come public and brag with things that I can prove because what we have to keep in mind always is you can hatch a cool gecko, but that doesn't guarantee that this is something truly genetic that is reproducible and that should be reproduced. Right. We remember there have been times where we saw beautiful geckos having, 
you know, a link uh, where a mutation that is very beautiful has a bad link to a serious health issue. I remember the lemon frosts and uh, the enigmas and so on and so forth, and also the spiders in ball pythons and some other reptile mutations. So we always need to um, take that into consideration when there is something new and exciting hatches in our stock to take it a little, a little bit with a grain of salt and just wait a little do careful test crossings and finding out, you know, what you really have and what you're really dealing with. And then you can come out publicly. This is my personal way of doing things because I feel more secure that way, that I also provide the accurate information and I'm not forced by saying, oh, this is cool. It's a new morph, but I don't know what it is. So mm -hmm. I don't think this is a good approach of doing things. So now let's start with the selection process. Um, as I said, I'm working with those few under 10, you know, projects and every project consists of several different groups. And once in a while, I'm needing to add, of course, you know, straight um, fresh blood and outcross. Because of the big gene pool in each project, I'm not forced of buying you know, animals every season. So I can be really picky here. Again, this works to my big advantage. I can take my time. I can observe the market. I can contact my breeder colleagues. This is usually the way that I go. I am, you know, the, you will find out that after a certain point, some animals just become available when you can also prove that you have the mentality mm -hmm. and the capacity to handle them appropriately because other breeders also are sometimes reluctant and for good reasons to sell their best animals to to someone you know that might produce them in masses or produce them in bad quality so this is the first thing i do i observe the market i am in constant contact with my colleagues sometimes i get contacted by them because they're like oh i know i, I just saw this animal and i think it's cool and i think it fits to your lines and sometimes um they're right and then i'm like yeah i'm interested ship it over and then i get it and then i will you know of course first i will evaluate on the pictures whether it fits into my program and when i have it it will come in quarantine again this is highly recommended for anybody i'll do a cryptosporidiosis test three times anyway so in that time when it's in the racks and in the quarantine i have enough time to check on the overall quality if there may be any flaws that i didn't recognize at first and this is always the risk when you're buying animals this can happen guys that's just normal that's life Last import that I did with 15 geckos, I had five geckos with issues. <laughs> they were really, really small and those were all beautiful animals, but one didn't have the good feeding response. One was a hidden white and yellow that neither the breeder and I were aware about. And I don't want to add any color enhancer in my old lines because I want to keep them clean as they are. And also I feel personally that in old projects, just putting a color enhancer on something is like putting an Instagram filter on it and saying, oh, look how I, how cool I look with makeup. It's not the same, you know. It yes. takes away the beauty of, of the purity of, of the thing. And sometimes it doesn't really add value. So for me, this is the way to go. At first, I'll taking this three months to really observe the animal, look at the feeding response, look at, you know, any... Exter uh, internal or external parasites, you know, checking the overall health and then, you know, also checking the weight and everything, the anatomy, the character. And when I find that this animal is fitting, this is the first phase where I, you know, also already select some animals that will have, you know, to leave to other, you know, uh, breeder friends or if they are having issues that exclude them from breeding at all I will sell them as pets only so that mm -hmm. answers my question what do you do with all those animals be careful how many animals you produce and how many animals you buy and only take what you can handle because the majority of them will go to other places because right. you can only take what's fitting in your program 100% you owe it that animals you know you owe it your animals that you're you're doing it that way that exactly. you're not polluting the lines with, you know, genes that might working to the animal's disadvantage in the next generation. So, can you quickly talk about the char the character piece? Like, what mm -hmm. do you look for, and and uh, yeah, what what characteristics are you selecting for? 
I exclude any aggressive mating behavior for males. I exclude any aggressive behavior from females and males in general. I trying to exclude a, um, any overly shy behavior or shy behavior if possible in any way. What I want is an open, trustful gecko. I also want to see a little spark of intelligence. So that's always something that I that piques my interest whenever I have the choice between two equal animals i pick the more intelligent one because mm -hmm. i want to see what what's coming and it reminds me so much of you know the raptors and my favorite movie so of course this is something that it's just a personal thing for me but overall a trustful open response a good feeding response this is something that that i'm looking for and what i also do of course i exclude any neurological issues whatsoever even if if it is a slight head wobbling so i don't care i don't want those genes into my gene pool and as i said i owe it to my animals so those animals will be sold as pet only and all other animals that have you know no major issues and are perfect for for other you know, breeding socks, but not for my specific goal in that specific project. They will just leave for other colleagues and other breeders here in Europe to enjoy. And that works very fine. But again, it works that way because I've drastically reduced my numbers and I'm not forced to sell my animals anymore. I've turned from a breeder selling his offspring to a facility that is based on and holding lines for the future. I'm the majority that I'm breeding, I'm breeding just for myself so I can keep them all if necessary and I'm not doing more. And if somebody wants to buy them and if I decide to part with them, that's fine, but I'm not forced to. But let's go back to this breeding process yes, because yeah. I feel we should, unfortunately it's a little bit more complex and it takes some time. So first thing is, you import the animal after you carefully get all your informations and watch the pictures and, you know, you see how the animal, um, you know, rates according to your breeding standard and you check, you know, the overall quality, the feeding response whatsoever and the health, of course, after um, any cryptosporidiosis uh, risk is ruled out, it can be safely introduced into your colony. And then, of course, you're not pairing her with any male, let's say it's a female. I will carefully pair her with one of my founder males. So like, again, Dragoon Gecko is not, you know, managed as a, as a just a breeding facility it is managed like a horse breeding or dog breeding facility meaning my lines go back many generations and they can be tracked down to very few valuable founding fathers and mothers and this is what i want to do i will select those animals that have proven to give me a certain quality of offspring so i know exactly what to expect from them, from their side. So anything else is added from, let's say, the female side that I know, you know, paired with this male. And if the results are really worse or not equal or better than I expected, she will be excluded from the breeding program in the next season. She will not stay in the breeding program. So we have a constant flow, a little bit, not much, but a little flow. And we will constantly, you know, thinking about and making sure is every animal really contributing to the next generation's quality in life or is it not? Because that is what nature would do. Of course, nature selects in the most, you know, <laughs> hardest way. Mm -hmm. But what we are doing genetically here is basically the same, just in a humane and animal friendly way. We're just making sure that animals who do not have the genetic capacity to produce healthy, vital offspring of a certain quality are passed to pet only homes where, you know, they are cared for and loved with all their heart by responsible keepers who, you know, never want to breed in the first place. They just want a pet. So those animals are perfect for them and it's beneficial for me and for my breeding stock. And same goes, of course, with the babies. Once the babies hatch from the pairing, you again compare them to your standard, you watch them, you watch their growing rate. Also, you keep track on the fertility of each group. I can tell you every season which group laid how many eggs, how many were fertile, how many died during incubation. So I can also rule out other factors. I can tell you exactly in which season outer factors played a role in losing eggs or molding. 
and where genetic issues cause that. Mm -hmm. So this is also very important to me. The more scientific data you collect and you put into a system that works for you, the better you are off and the more control you have because that is what it's all about. You have the responsibility and you can only manage this with, you know, carefully uh, getting a control and an overview on what you're dealing with. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and when you are line breeding, uh, how tight are you willing to go as far as relatedness? And then what were some of those inbreeded, inbreeding signs that you start to, if you notice, you know, that you've gone too close? That's a really tough question, the first one, because it is all based on experience. The less experience you have, the further you want to stay away from inbreeding. So what do you have to understand and what um, was said perfectly in the very, very good and thorough dog breeding book is your you have to be able to read pedigrees. Once you're really going into dog breeding, I've been the dog breeding scene for over 10 years, you will realize a majority of people can't read pedigrees. And they think it's just, you know, for for show that you can see, oh, the mother was Ida of whatever, Arkenstein and whatever. That, that's not what it's all about. I don't care about the name of the dog. What I care about is it's like you're looking in an ancient Egypt chamber and you're able to read the hieroglyphs. This is what a pedigree really, the true power of a pedigree lies behind what the name implies. So if you know the name and the identity of an animal. You can track this animal down. You can dead value. You can get valuable data. I can find out. Okay, what qualities has this bitch? What sire was she paired to? What is the ancestors? What do they look like? What did she got from which ancestor? How closely were they related? How do the siblings from the litter look that are not at the pedigree? And then you're. You see, it's getting very complicated. You're dealing with a lot of dogs, but after a while, you're starting to see a pattern and a path. And this is really the true power when it comes about breeding. You have to be able to read the hieroglyphs and read a pedigree the correct way. And then you will see pedigrees where there has been a massive amount of inbreeding with a high inbreeding coefficient and you will see fantastic pedigrees with a sound line breeding and well-selected dogs that have real genetic power to you know really strongly push that good desirable traits into the next generations and that's what you want to see and that's what you want to focus on so once you understand that and only when you understand that you can even think about dealing with the topic of inbreeding because what inbreeding is and that was written in those book. It was fantastic. Inbreeding is a double-edged sword. Inbreeding is basically like in a poker game when you put all the cards on the table. That's the move. You can see all the cards. Inbreeding doesn't improve quality. Never. It only shows you and reveals in the phenotype what you have hidden in the genotype. So it puts the genes out of you for you to see to put it simply. But what it also does is creates it creates great risks of, you know, inbreeding depression, of, you know, animals having serious problems if you don't know what you're doing. So my advice is for all the beginners, try to stay away as much as possible. Do considerate line breeding, meaning far related animals, regular outcrossings, and then you're having the system, and that's what I want to do. I'm trying to work with big groups, with far-related animals. This allows me to, you know, breed within those colonies without having to outcross all the time. Nevertheless, after a few generations, I have to do this. And what it often means is that the first quality declines because, of course, the more inbreeding you do, the more closer the more uniformity you can achieve. But the higher the risk is of, you know, all those nasty things like, you know, inbreeding depressions, missing eyes, kink tails, general weakness, general infertility, you really want to do, uh, you know, have this in your colony because once you have it in, it's impossible to get out. And I sometimes see breeders, big mistake number one, wasting so much time and money and unfortunately animals by thinking, oh, this is an inbred animal. No problem. I'll breed this inbreeding depression out of it. Yes. 
a bad animal will always produce bad animals, guys. It's too late. It's like, oh, I crashed a car, but it will be all right. Nobody will see it. It's broken, guys. It's kaput. <laughs> That's yes. a new word that I learned. There you go. But, kaput, you yeah. know, sometimes you can't really you can't really change things for the better and you have to carefully evaluate when this point you know is coming into play so it is not an easy answer and it is something that is very responsible and that you have to take very serious so in general the further you stay away from close inbreedings the safer you are but of course the slower the process goes mm -hmm. and what i want to do is i always evaluate if I have a really fertile, strong line, you know, that has, that are bees that are growing like crazy and eating like crazy, then maybe, and only if I really need it, I can take the risk of going a little bit further in one generation genetically, but then I want to outcross again. Mm -hmm. And in general, when I see I have a beautiful line and it could need a little genetic touch-up, but they're also not really eating so well like the others. You need to have an eye for the details. If you feel they're just slightly not so good eaters than the others, don't go, don't do the risk of going, you know, with, with inbreeding even further into the problem, trying to solve the problem by considerately thinking about which genes from outside could contribute to this look, could, you know, improve this look or at least and hold this look for the next generation, do an outcrossing and also make sure that the animal you are outcrossing will strongly displace all the things that are missing in your line. In this case, you want to have an animal that grows crazy, eats like crazy and brings his health and fertility into this line. Mm -hmm. So, well, I, and I think, one analogy you could use with the inbreeding thing, and because I, I think you're right, I so often see people. I'm going to breed this problem out, you know, whether it's a you know some sort of genetic issue, and you have to think of it like sculpting stone. If you break off a large chunk of that stone, you don't get it back. So it, the damage yes. is done. There's no way to fix or add the thing back into the system. It's already done. So you have to kind of restart. Perfect. And so it's a, it's it's a permanent problem, and yeah. it's funny hearing you say you know because. I'll quite often, especially in the, the snake breeding community, their first move is an inbred situation. It's like, oh, this, this snake hatched out. In two years, I'm going to breed him back to his mom to see what happens. And uh, like you said, they're just going all in on the poker game and they haven't done any thinking. So, you know, that, that, is, that is an issue. So as far as we're talking about relatedness in the, in the line breeding, you know, what, what would be something comfortable you'd with as far as relatedness? I mean, I guess we could use like human terms. Are we talking like cousins, like, you know, um, distant? So when oh, go we ahead. go into inbreeding, we have to be aware that a parent to, you know, child breeding, father to daughter, mother to son is the strongest form of inbreeding. This is the biggest you know, amount of inbreeding coefficient that you can go. It takes away basically 50% of this animal's genetic variability. 50%, just in one generation. Imagine you're doing this for three generations, you're done. Mm -hmm. You're dead. It's just not possible in many cases. Again, there is not one, you know, claim that fits for all, for all situations. But in general, I would say that this is a very dangerous road to go, especially when you're doing it multiple times behind each other. This is yeah. the fastest and most secure way to get yourself into massive inbreeding trouble. Then the second thing, um, the second, the strongest thing is what you can do sibling pairing. And uh, then of course comes cousin. So what you can do is what I like to do is when I have one animal that I want to pair it to different partners. And then again, I pair those offspring to different well-selected animals. And then they are only far related. And then I can, you know, choose the best fitting ones. And there are two generations in between. And this is where I start normally. So I have a very low inbreeding coefficient. I have, you know, making sure that with five or six other breeders, I got a lot of other genes into play. But of course, it slows down the process. You have to be patient and you need to trust in yourself. And not every, you know, cool gecko is able to reproduce its traits. That's also what you have to keep in mind all the yes. time. 
yeah, the genetics aren't necessarily locked in. You know, it might look cool, but who the hell knows what it's going to throw off. Uh, I, I want to I want to get into the, the ethical side of, of, of morph breeding because, you know, you have so much information. I think we could talk for hours. If, if somebody is, you know, that is listening to this and like, this makes so much sense to me, I want to get into a morph breeding project, whether it's leopard geckos or otherwise. Can, can you talk a little bit about your genetic coaching business so people can, if they want to delve into the real deep end with you, they could do that. Um, how would they contact you and what, what would they, what, what sort sure. of service is that? Yeah, sure. So um, just by picking up where, where we left at the last, last question, um, what would I do? This is just a fictional example. And, what I do strongly depends on the animals in question, on the, you know, fertility, general strength in breeding science I see on this animal or not. So every situation is different and re often requires a different approach for the best results. So this is exactly where the coaching comes into play here. Normally what happens is that people approach me and they're booking an hourly, you know, coaching service. And uh, in this few hours that we estimate, uh, we will try to, you know, set up the perfect breeding plan for them or helping them find the right project. So basically it covers a wide variety of topics. I have clients that just need help even with selecting the right project. So what should I breed? I don't know. I have this and this and this and this and what makes sense or I want to breed super snow with tangerines and i want to produce super snow tangerines then i can tell them <laughs> this is unfortunately not something that would work uh, but <laughs> i can you know give you the tip if you want to go into tangerines this and that i could recommend or either way if you want to go into super snows then you could do it this way so this is something that i do a lot actually and <laughs> it's always funny that you know people are in you know um yeah, standing at the crossroads and having a hard time to decide. So I'm really happy when I can help them out here and giving them also valuable insights um, on their colony. Some people want their colony to be evaluated. And this is also something that I only do for pay, not because I'm, you know, e evil, but I figured out that for many people, they can't really deal very well with criticism and whenever you're you're paying me for criticizing and honestly evaluating the stock then I can be sure that this is something that you really want because I don't see it as my job to to mess with others uh breeding projects and tell them what to do and I know that sometimes beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder what I find beautiful the ghost for example might be not the perfect thing for someone else because he prefers bright belts then maybe the neon belts from me will be a better fit so um i really you know respect and appreciate diversity so i'm always happy to to critically evaluate the stock and uh, hint where improvement could be done but this is also something that i do in a safe and enclosed environment so the person is also not publicly you know forced to hear my answer and can you know think about in 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 private if they really want to do this and you know which of my tips they really want to mm -hmm. to apply so i also coach people you know evaluating their offspring i evaluate people with you know you know sticking in a dead end and really not knowing how to proceed or having fear of going too deep into inbreeding how to solve this problem or breeding for 5 years and not really you know seeming to get the way that works for them the geckos are nice but they wanted orange and now they're more yellow or whatever so mm -hmm. there's a really wide variety of of topics that i cover i also help clients to find fitting breeding partners from unrelated projects for their project sometimes that is the issue i have a lot of contact so it's no problem for me for not i mean i'm not a magician but of course sometimes it, it is easier for me you know um getting into contact with others and you know selecting an animal for my client that will you know bring as especially those things on the table that they now need for the next generation mm -hmm. Well, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with charging for that because that sounds like an incredible service. And I think if anyone is really serious about breeding, which I hope that this conversation has made people realize that there's light 
at the you know there's some daylight here in the morph breeding world uh, but we what well, we the ship has gone the wrong direction i think you've already laid out a bunch of the reasons why that already is but i i think one of the main issues especially here in north america with the morph breeding is the massive depression of care that comes along with the the idea of trying to produce something so you know how how do we solve that problem how do we solve the issue mm-hmm. that it becomes a mass production um, enterprise rather than starting with animal welfare first so maybe you could also just lay out how your you know adults are cared for you already said they're not in tubs they're in larger systems i would love to hear you know how you care for them and so how you're able to do all this with with still having an enriched environment for them yeah so what i see and what makes me really sad is that of course this has always been the problem um there have always been fantastic breeders that do wonderful work, both on the professional side with many animals in their care and, you know, hobbyist breeders like myself. And I remember seeing, you know, facilities with rack keeping that were responsible and the racks were, you know, allowing the geckos to really roam a little bit more free and and they were clean and well cared for and the breeder knew exactly which animal was in which tub and you could really feel that this person although it was rag keeping um was really dedicated to to his work and what makes me sad is that so many people see you know their videos and the excellent care that they provide for their animals, but they are not willing to put in the same work. They are just copying the rec system like it is the holy grail of everything, but then they don't feed the animals so often. They don't clean the animals so often. They find it, they discover that it is hard work cleaning 100 tubs every two days. And maybe that's not what they want to do. So they clean it once a week. And after that, they are cleaning it every two weeks. And then you see pile of, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah feces everywhere and, and uh, situations that are not very hygienic and, um, you know, offering a big risk for, for, um, yeah, <sighs> diseases and uh, other problems. So, I think one of the major problems with people that coming into the hobby or that are new to the hobby is that they underestimate the amount of care that really goes into the animals. Also to just to maintain and care for them on a daily basis. And also if you have five geckos and one of them is not eating properly and you have to assist feed him, that's fine. But imagine you're having 200 geckos and you have to assist feed 20 of them every day. How do you manage? How do you cope with that? It's just not possible. I can imagine no way without help. So you have to pay people for helping you out. And of course, that's not being done most of the time because the market, especially in you know the current situation, is under pressure. And many animals that we see on the internet for display are, you know, in the lower price range compared to 10, 15 years ago. So this is just a phase. There are always amazing people there. And I want to make that very, very clear. But I'm right. Uh, you're right. I think you're right. I totally agree here. We have a, a massive problem with people underestimating, taking the rec system and underestimating the care. But also, I mean, you can neglect your, your animals also in a terrarium. I mean, this is not based on the housing conditions. It's based on how you take responsibility in a sound hygienic care and providing the animal uh, environment they can thrive in. So I really encourage people to try out, you know, the terrarium approach because it's more fun. It is really exciting. It, It makes so much fun to decorate. It is really, you know, more interesting for you to go through your stock you're spending more time i personally find that i'm spending more time uh you know on free will more enjoyable <laughs> on my time. animals yeah because i enjoy it and then i see little things here and there and just goes to okay i clean this here and make this there and it's not really work for me and i don't see it as okay today's cleaning day and then it's feeding day and you know next day is office day but you're finding yourself in a situation that is more comfortable for you personally. So um, also I see our whole environment and 
um, economy changing. We're what we have to see is that in the last years we've been the whole industry has been put more and more under pressure from animal rights activists and people that you know, are really trying to get the hobby away from us and. I don't say this in, and, and mean this in any way, you know, to, to point fingers or something. It is not that wrecks are a bad thing. It is just that for someone from outside, it gives so much more room and space for criticism than a terrarium. So this is something that we as a society have to take into consideration and although it is not, you know, a necessity in the U.S. to keep animals in terrariums yet, we don't know what the future brings. Um, it is worth thinking about, especially as a newcomer breeder, to set up, especially when you're on social media, to present yourself and your animals in the best and most responsible way possible. And that includes thinking about, do you want to keep the animals in wrecks or do you want to keep them in terrariums on whatever you do, no matter what you choose? Do you show and showcase your animals in perfect conditions or do you show them in a clear sign of neglect? Because that is what happens so often when I open TikTok. I can't believe my eyes. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, those videos would be put to, to rights and activists and make their way to the press, this is Bad. heartbreaking for me because it it destroys the foundation for all the people who really love their animals with all their hearts and trying so hard providing for those animals in the best way possible. And I have to say what also, you know, it also takes away from future generations. Just imagine reptiles make amazing pets for several reasons. They are many of them through selective breeding. Mine have been bred for docile behavior for 15 generations, some of those lines. So they are nothing compared to the wild ones. They are trustful. They are genetically designed to love you mm -hmm. and to trust you. And that's what you feel. I have so many pictures also on the website where I have a newborn baby cuddling and snuggling in my hand and people are always asking me, how do you do that picture? What's the trick? There's no trick. It's just, it is designed to be that way. It trusts me. It, you know, I, I make the first contact, I always hold them in my hands and the, you know, socialization together with the genetic impact makes the animal recognize me as a source of food, a source of shelter and someone that is definitely fun to be around with or at least interesting or tolerable to be around with. And I think that is really important. So they make tame, beautiful animals for people that couldn't, you know, care for a dog or a cat out of time issues, out of space issues, out of, I don't know, allergies. So they're easy to care for. If you want to go on holidays for many species, you, you can basically go a few days off and they will be fine. If they're mm -hmm. adults, if you provide them with food and water, try that with a cat. <laughs> I'm not so sure how well yeah. it goes. So um, they're more social. They require more care than a reptile or a gecko. Um they do not depend on you cuddling them all the time and you shouldn't for sure, but you know, they're making great pets. And I think that the future is very, very bright because we see so many mini apartments. We see so many single people uh, in really time consuming jobs. So reptiles definitely are offering um, a niche for those people to, to care for an animal, to bound with an animal in a, in a very deep and special way. And I can say, honestly, I have my some of my leopard geckos longer than I had my dog. And I loved my dog with all my heart, but I have such a special connection with Saturn and some others. And this is really unique. And mm -hmm. it comes from both sides. So it's not just me, you know, um, loving this gecko. It's also coming from his side that I can really feel that he he realizes there is some respect from my side. And I, I'm not pushing him, you know, pick him up whenever I want it. And I'm letting him roam free and decide what he wants to do. And he's paying it back with so interesting behavior and and affection also that he you know is coming to my hand when i lay my hand in the terrarium he's climbing on my hand and he's sitting there and he's tolerating sometimes now he is getting older he has some more shed issues due to his age mm -hmm. he is so tolerable when i you know i'm helping him because i know um 
that he at least understands through all the years of care that he is in a safe space. And right. that's a beautiful thing to see. And yeah, I yeah. would really be sad to see, you know, more people contributing to a bad image. And I can really encourage people. And I hope this is the takeaway for today's episode. People, there is a safe way and secure way. There's nothing wrong with going into morph making or wanting to, you know, do something on your own or becoming a leopard gecko breeder that is respected and well known. You can do that. And I'm here to help you to achieve that. I want you to succeed. And I will be so happy and proud if I see that all of you, you know, will take into consideration what has been said today and maybe take this as an inspiration to put the animals needs and, you know, um, yeah, desires first and then being inspired. And once I did that, of course, it changed everything for me. I still got my first world's combos. It didn't stop. My success didn't stop. In fact, it got even better. I was just so focused in the first years that, you know, just the goal of producing something was the main focus. And when it switched to how can I really improve this for the animals and for me and, you know, contribute something to a positive image? This is when everything changed. And once I slowed down and sold fewer animals, I really unplugged from the market and its needs. I became free and so did my animals. I'm not forced to sell leopard geckos. That doesn't mean that I don't sell at all. Or it doesn't mean that people are not asking me if I have animals for sale. I sell, I still sale. And it, it is so less stressful for me. And I can really take, you know, into consideration um, if someone is a good fit for the gecko. And I can work so much more freely and really work with the lines that are close to my heart and that I find really important to, you know, and hold for the future. So maybe this is something that also the one or the other of you would like to do in the future that we can not only focus on creating something new and hot but also treasure and hold what's so valuable and beautiful from the past for the future yeah that is extremely well said and i think you know if you're working the way you work these are pet geckos and you can prove that they're pet geckos you're breeding for character you're breeding for interesting colors they're not they're, they're so far removed from the wild that it's really a domestication process and it, it it's probably one of the better arguments for why we should be allowed to keep these reptiles right we're getting this pressure from animal rights groups it's like the lines that you're working on are pet reptiles and they're yes. designed to be pet reptiles and they're happy in captivity and they they're content being cared for and they're they're relaxed and they would come completely die in the wild if they were to ever make their way back there because they're not designed for the harsh realities of mother nature. So this is a project that is specifically for keeping reptiles in captivity. And I think it's, it's so important. And I think this is an episode that the, this, the animals at home podcast in general needed because I've always been quite critical of the morph side because of the ethical issues that we've talked about the care and the overproduction and the sort of chasing the thing without having a knowledge base. And I think it's so refreshing to actually find someone who is as thorough as you are. I mean, I can't believe how thorough you are. And I think people are going to be just, you know, blown away at, at just the way you go through these things, how methodical you are. And it's just so important. And, and the other thing I'll say too, because you, you, you seem so young, but you have all this incredible experience, but you also have lots of people can go back and listen to other podcasts you've done. You, you've, uh, you have articles published. You have, you, you, some of your work is in books. There's ton, it's not just you've paired a couple of geckos over five years and you have this information. This is a long time of uh, built up knowledge that is going into these, the way you think and the way you do things. So it's not, you're not coming off on a whim. This is, a well thought out plan and I think that's really important for people to drive home and if they want to go into other content that you've uh, contributed on we'll make sure that's all in the show notes for people to see because it's it's I think that's important as well thank you I, I really honestly hope that this episode serves as, as an example that you can do breeding and you know in a responsible way and that you don't have to decide whether you want to be a morph breeder or if you you want to love and, and care for your gecko so 
the one doesn't go without the other. And I would be so thrilled and excited to see more and more people, you know, taking in what we discussed today and really thinking about how to change their social media content, you know, how to inspire others, passing the torch, you know, um, enlightening this fire in others, the desire to, to constantly improve, do something better and just display as a, as an industry, as a hobby, this love that we have for those animals, how precious they are, how far they have come from the first imports in the wild 30 years ago. There's almost nothing left. As I said, um, breeding for character brings out so interesting experiences. I have um, one ghost female, Kalara. She's one of the founding mothers of all the striped um, ghost stuff or many of my offspring you know, um, have her in her pedigree when they are in the stripe line. And you can still see that the great, great, great granddaughters, they still have this little extra character that she has. It's, mm. it's amazing. So it seems to pop up in every generation in one or the other baby, you still have a little Calera type somewhere. So she's very curious. She's not the color, but she's very aware and awake and you realize her character from all the others and this has nothing to do with the wild ancestors that we we got them from those modern leopard gecko color morph lines they are like our modern dog lines they right. evolved from the wolf to something that you know thrives in human care as long as we take the responsible step of providing them what they need and if that is the message for today i'm so happy <laughs> Well, I think you definitely nailed that message. I'm sure, like I said, people are going to be really blown away at this episode. And it, it's just nice to find somebody who's working with morphs that isn't, you know, just doing things on a whim. Is there anything that we didn't say today that you wanted to say before we officially wrap up? I think we covered almost everything. Oh, we just my. To. Um, there are so many topics that we, <laughs> we could go on forever. <laughs> Maybe a part two will be needed at some point. Uh, yeah, sure. I was just talking with a colleague about, you know, purity of lines and the problems that are caused with this. So this is something we could go on for hours and a very interesting and very complex topic to, a, um, you know, what seems to be a simple answer. So whenever there's interest, I would be happy to go into that or, yeah. or other toppings in detail in the future. Well, why don't we do that? We'll we'll leave some stuff on the table because we've already we're going to hit two hours almost, and so this is an extremely thorough episode to begin with. So we'll leave some topics on the table. People are going to, I'm sure there'll be questions and whatnot in the YouTube comments for people, and then we can explore those next time. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Sure, you can find me online on my website. It's uh, www.dragoongecko.com. It's my old website by purpose. You, it's not modern, but you can see it has all the infos of my early years and some of my best of. So that's a perfect place to start and like a, you know, genetic library for for people who want to dive into the first years and the beginnings of my work. You can find my recent work on Facebook at Dragoon Gecko and of course on my Instagram account. Dragoon Gecko and uh, at uh, my Instagram account you will also find the link to my newsletter where you can get first pick on my geckos because um, as I said we are doing things differently I'm selling this season it's the first time in six years that I will be releasing <laughs> Wow. any offspring to the public. So the last six years I just bred for myself and I had many people asking. So I came up with a system that ensures we're doing things a little different. That's what those email newsletters for. All people on the newsletter will get the first pick and uh, I will probably only sell my animals over this newsletter in order to stay a little away from social media and ensure that animals are not bought, you know, on a spontaneous impulse but that you know only people who really truly are interested and have thought about it a little bit in advance are you know getting the chance and and uh, the possibility on on seeing what's available instead of everybody in the internet and then you have you know maybe situations where minors are um, wanting to buy animals but maybe legally or socially are not really able to do it Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to do that. And yeah, of course. That, yeah, I, was just, I think that's a great idea. That way you can be way <laughs> more selective and uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. And well, Rebecca, this was a, 
incredible conversation. I think you are a very fascinating individual. And, you know, I, I think partly, you know, like you're saying, kind of staying away from social media, you do have a social media account, but it's also quite mysterious. Like you only pop up, you know, your face only pops up a couple times. And so you, you don't really know the person behind these projects, which is probably by design. And so it's great to kind of hear some of, you know, to yeah. really pick your brain and learn from you. So thank you so much. We will 100% do a part two because I think it's absolutely needed. But until then, this was a pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on the show. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dylan, so very, very much for having me here today at Animals at Home podcast. I so much enjoyed it. And it's for me personally, a great honor and privilege being a guest in a podcast that is really, you know, focusing on animal welfare, on asking also critical questions and just, you know, trying to to see things from a little different approach and always keeping the animals in mind. This is something that I've really enjoyed, you know, listening to your previous podcasts uh, with your amazing ho guests and uh, your great hosts. So thank you so very much for having me. It was my honor and privilege. And I hope that, you know, some insights of European um, reptile keeping and breeding have been interesting for the audience today and hopefully see you again soon. Yes, absolutely. It was my pleasure. All right. That is the end of that episode. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. As I said at the end, you are a very fascinating person. I don't think I've had someone as thorough as you are on the podcast. You're so prepared and your answers were so thought out. And even, I mean, that, that shows in your breeding process as well. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that. We will definitely do a part two in the future because I think there's way more information to extract from Rebecca. It's it's not often that you find someone who's that dedicated to a single type of project. You know, a lot of people are scattered and doing many things with and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's it's hard to beat when somebody is, you know, obsessed with one thing. Because they, especially when they do it for such a long period of time, there's so much info to extract there. I would love to hear your opinion on this episode. What do you think about the morph breeding side when it comes to this process that Rebecca laid out here? Like I said in the intro, it's hard to poke holes through this as, as she's really checked almost all the boxes when it comes to robustness, of your health, longevity of these animals, fertility, breeding for character. Yes, there's a morph breeding aspect to it, but it's done in a way that is creating a stronger and more vigorous animal, which I think is incredible. So I would love to hear your opinions. If you're watching on YouTube, you can do that in the comments. Spotify actually lets you comment as well. So if you're listening on audio, you can head to the, um, the comment section there and leave your thoughts. I always read those and try to respond as I can. If you are looking for more information on the podcast, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. If you would like to join us on Patreon, you can do that at patreon.com slash animalsathome. As always, thank you to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this podcast and supporting the production of the show. It is a, I'm very, very grateful for that support. If you would like to show your support for the show via Custom Reptile Habitats, you can do that with the affiliate links in the YouTube description or the show notes. Again, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you if you do make a purchase. And that is it. Let's jump in. Well, I was about to say jump into the episode. That's what I say in the intro. <laughs> We're done the episode. I'm actually recording another podcast in about an hour from now. So that's what I'll be getting prepared for. But that won't be out till next week for you guys. Anyway, that's enough from me. I'll see you guys in the next episode.